Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. You can subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast, at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite download service, and never miss the great content we offer. Hello, and thanks for joining us again today on A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Buck Haverker, a faculty member here at the War College and one of the editors at the War Room. Today's podcast deals with the U.S. approach to European strategic autonomy. Colonel Robert Gleckler is a recent graduate of the U.S. Army War College and an instructor at the Eisenhower School at the National Defense University. Welcome, Rob. Hi, Buck. He's also joined today by Dr. Joel Hillison, who is a professor of National Security Studies at the U.S. Army War College. Joel, it's good to have you back in the studio again. Thank you, Buck. I'm glad to be here. Uh, So, uh, you know, to get straight to it, I guess the first question right off the bat is, what are we here to talk about today, Joel? Yeah, Buck, thanks for asking. So, you know, I'm big on anniversaries, and this year was the 70th anniversary of NATO. Last year was the 70th anniversary of the Treaty of Brussels. And this was really the first attempt after World War II for European nations to come together and provide some sort of collective security uh, arrangement. And, and this Treaty of Brussels led to the, the, the NATO Treaty, the Western European Union. And just last year, President Macron of France called for the creation of a real European army. And, and my question to you, Rob, I know you just recently wrote a paper about this. Um, can, you, can you talk about the early history of European efforts to create strategic autonomy, and did the U.S. support these efforts? Why or why not? Well, thanks, Joel. Uh, So the key to understanding this uh, question or to addressing this question in the early Cold War is to focus on the topic of German rearmament. Uh, By 1949, as you mentioned, NATO had been established, but Germany was still an occupied power. Uh, The Korean War had kicked off in 1950, so a lot of attention was focused in the Far East on uh, the United States and its United Nations allies fighting in uh, Korea. And so the uh, conflict in Europe was seen as uh, the uh, as a potential um, strategic feint uh, in Korea that potentially there could be a conflict in Europe. We'd just been through the Berlin blockade. There were uprisings of uh, communist uprisings uh, that uh, the United States has helped to uh, put down in Greece and and elsewhere. So there was a fear of potentially the Soviets uh, could uh, launch a conventional attack west. And frankly, uh, the uh, Europeans and uh, uh, the United States looked at the operational uh, reality on the ground saying we can't essentially uh, defend Europe without the participation of Germans. Yeah, even more than that. I mean, even before then, the U.S., as it always does, was looking for a peace dividend, bringing the boys home. And uh, we we thought this partnership with Russia might carry forward. And then, you know, as Churchill mentioned, with the Iron Curtain descending and and Russian interference in Czech Republic and all these things, and now Korea, you know, our our assessment of the strategic environment changed. So, So not only were we looking to reassess how we approached the Soviet Union, but we were looking for help, right? That's right. So the U.S. forces in the early uh, aftermath of the uh, of World War II and the early Cold War, they were occupation forces. They were constabulary forces. So there was a real concern uh, uh, after the invasion of Korea that something like that could happen uh, with Soviet forces. So Although NATO had been established, Germany was not participating. They were not allowed to participate. They weren't even sovereign at this time. And so really to understand this question, key players like France, the United States, uh, and Germany, uh, is to understand what their timelines were and what their interests were. For France, the idea of Germany rearming was just a non-starter. But because they saw the writing on the wall, they were desirous, my assessment, of at least delaying this for as long as possible. If they've got to rearm, it should take as long as possible. Whereas the United States timeline was, this has got to happen sooner rather than later. So with that, uh, uh, France's uh, foreign minister, Schumann, he made a proposal uh, for a European coal and steel community, which would uh, lead to economic integration. It's actually the precursors of the European Union. But he also proposed a European army in which the Germans would provide manpower but absolutely no leadership and no staff. Yeah, and, and it's interesting they chose coal and steel to cooperate with because, one, those are the two commodities that you have to ramp up if you intend to go to war. And secondly, 
Europe was trying to, still trying to rebuild its economy and institutions and infrastructure to do that. You also needed steel and coal. So I think these are interesting times, both economically and politically, that these efforts were going forward by Mr. Schuman. So Mr. Schuman's proposal was immediately seen as unrealistic. I mean, the Germans themselves had no appetite. I mean, these we're talking folks who had just been through the Second World War. Mm-hmm. Popular, it was it was not popular. The idea of rearming, even inside of Germany, and certainly not inside of France. So the idea of providing individual repl- uh, participants as uh, in, into some sort of French or Allied-led army was just a non-starter. Uh, the United States, in 1950, immediately followed with a counterproposal, uh, essentially for, known as uh, the Package Agreement, which was essentially uh, NATO, the Supreme Allied Commander, would be an American. Uh, the U.S. will increase its financial aid to Europe. The U.S. will send more forces to Europe, but the Allies have to integrate Germans into uh, forces under NATO. That was the U.S. counterproposal. Mm-hmm. And the French and other Europeans saw this as some sort of an ultimatum, a take it or leave it. It didn't go over well. Uh, it's interesting also in this, the Germans weren't consulted. They were an occupied uh, so uh, force no defeated. They didn't have any vote yeah. in this. Uh, so there was a counter-counter proposal, which uh, we know as the Plevin Plan, which was essentially French Premier René Plevin proposes a European army in which Germans would participate at no more than regimental combat team level, no German staff. Uh, and he got this through the French National Assembly, amazingly, uh, by saying, look, this isn't a German national army. It's ger- just German manpower. And it was derided as rearming the Germans without rearming Germany. So... Uh, it, this this was really the start of uh, the Europeans trying uh, uh, to have some sort of autonomy outside of NATO. The idea, the critical idea of all of this was that this European army would fall under whatever political institutions the European coal and steel community established. Hmm. So that immediately causes a conflict of interest with NATO, who has a supreme allied commander, there was even talk of a European defense minister. So this was a non-starter with the Americans, mm-hmm. which was essentially how we can't possibly get this off the ground because economic integration will take years, which was precisely what the French were looking after, is that we don't want to see Germans armed until we can get our economy back uh, together. Uh, just to kind of fast forward uh, uh, a little bit, uh, this roadblock, the United States essentially... Um, because it was so focused on getting NATO established, essentially decoupled these four things from the package agreement Hmm. and agreed to say, okay, let's just get NATO off the ground. And once we get NATO off the ground, uh, we'll focus on European institutions. Uh, Oddly enough, by the time Eisenhower becomes a Supreme Allied commander and agrees to take over command of NATO, the US has flipped 180 degrees and said, okay, if, if your price is European economic integration, then we'll do that and we'll press hard for that if that's your price, France, for getting Germans, to, for allowing Germans uh, to rearm. So, yeah. Yeah, no, so I, I was just going to interject that. Cause it, another interesting point is personalities matter. And so the fact that Eisenhower was the first Sakir or Supreme Allied mm-hmm. Commander of Europe, he had already commanded Allied forces during World War II, had good rapport with all the politicians and strategic leaders. Uh, Montgomery was his first DSAC year or deputy strategic Allied commander. The other thing is that uh, the personalities between Schumann and uh, Adenauer were important because Schumann was from the Lorraine region, a coal-producing region in France. Adenauer was from Cologne, which was also an area that produced a lot of coal. They, they were close to each other. They, they, they had similar ideas or aspirations for closer relations between France and Germany. So it wasn't just the strategic environment enabled this, but also the personality seemed to be right to to set off this successful attempt at some form of European strategic autonomy. But as we know, that didn't happen, right? Well, I'm glad you bring up uh, Conrad Adenauer, because for me, in reading about his moves in the early uh, post-war period, if you ever want to read an example of a political leader playing a weak hand to perfection, it's Conrad Adenauer, because German is occupied. Germany is occupied. He's got pushback at home for being called a sellout to the Allies for agreeing to uh, uh, Germany to be split in East and West, uh, and uh, 
basically he plays his weak hand saying to the Allies, look, you want Germans in your formations? We need to be sovereign. And so essentially when the NATO Allies begin essentially negotiating with Konrad Adenauer, the chancellor of an occupied state, they're essentially implying that he's sovereign. And by the time this ends, by 1955, Germany is incorporated as a NATO member, or uh, its forces are incorporated under NATO in 1955. So near, only 10 years after being a defeated occupied power, the rest, Western uh, Federal Republic of Germany is sovereign and incorporated under NATO. So that's, that's the early uh, uh, efforts uh, uh, of Europeans to essentially establish uh, defense institutions. Why didn't they? Why didn't the European army ever take place? Because obviously it, it didn't, right? Yeah. So uh, essentially, this counter counter proposal of the Plevin Plan, uh, the it got as far as uh, a European defense community, which was essentially the proposed sort of uh, defense institution under the European Coal and Steel, uh, had some. It even got as far as being um, ratified by the German uh, Bundestag as well as the, uh, uh, the United States Senate ratified the idea of a European defense community. Uh, but by 1953, strategic situation had changed. Eisenhower was the president now. He was looking at the new look uh, for the military, focusing more on atomic weapons rather than get ground troops. The shock of the Korean War was over. That had kind of settled, uh, and uh, it, it seemed that France was uh, France. The French National Assembly ultimately rejected uh, the idea of a European army. NATO was off the ground. Stalin was dead. So essentially, the strategic situation had changed, and that gets back to my uh, um, essentially assessment that the United States has typically been immediately paranoid or pushing back against any sort of non-NATO. But when the strategic situation changed, we were essentially okay uh, uh, with this, uh, albeit being incorporated under NATO. So, so that, that brings up a good point. I mean, so we really don't hear about this effort for European nations to, to seek any sort of strategic autonomy again to almost 40 years later. That's right. The, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Talk to me a little bit about how this, these efforts uh, f towards European strategic autonomy reared their head again in the post-Cold War period. So that's the, that's a, the next sort of key uh, period to analyze, uh, which is essentially the Balkan Wars of the 1990s. Uh, frankly, Europe was embarrassed by its inability to handle uh, uh, conflict, civil war in its own backyard without uh, the uh, intervention of the Americans or the leadership of the United States. It was an embarrassment to have the Balkan Wars settled in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, and the, Tony Blair, uh, who's, you know, the UK has typically been pro-NATO, uh, even Tony Blair essentially in 1998 chastised the UK for, and the Europeans for being unable to pull this off uh, without the intervention of the Americans. And that began to change uh, as Kosovo, the fighting in Kosovo reared its head, uh, uh, essentially, that became a NATO operation. Um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about um, the, the San Malo Agreement and kind of how that led the current efforts to establish a EU or European uh, foreign policy security uh, auto autonomy program? Yeah, so uh, in 1998, as Kosovo was heating up and looking in the near rearview mirror of their failure in uh, in the Balkans without U.S. leadership, uh, France and Britain signed a Saint uh, a Saint Malo Agreement, uh, a declaration at an EU conference, which called for the European Council to frame a common foreign and security policy, and for the EU to have the capacity for autonomous action, backed up by credible military forces and the means to decide to use them. So simply, uh, essentially, the St. Malo Declaration aimed for the EU to have its own defense cap uh, capacity to act either within or 
autonomous, autonomously from NATO. And the United States was 100% behind this effort. <laughs> right. We threw all our weight behind it. And... and so as you can imagine, the U.S. initial reaction, immediate reaction to the St. Malo agreements was no, uh, was to reject it. And uh, Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of State at the time, uh, articulated U.S. policy through what she called the three Ds. No decoupling of European decision-making on defense from NATO. Uh, no duplication of scarce resources between NATO and the EU, and no discrimination against NATO members who aren't also EU members. And essentially, the context was a decade in which the United States, after significant military reductions after the 91 Gulf War, had felt compelled to assist the Europeans to establish security on their borders in Bosnia. Uh, so that was essentially the United States' immediate reaction was, don't decouple from NATO don't discriminate against NATO members who aren't members of the EU, and uh, don't duplicate resources. Yeah, so we came a lot of, a long way from the early 90s where Balkans, that's a European problem, Europeans take care of it, to while they can't take care of it, they need the U.S. and NATO to get involved to, okay, you can get more autonomy, but it has to be within framed within the context of the NATO security yeah. umbrella. That's right, and by 99 at a NATO summit, uh, NATO agreed... Uh, to allow the EU access to NATO capabilities, quote, when the alliance as a whole is not engaged. But that seems to fit with the Balkan experience. Essentially, it would allow uh, NATO members uh, to actually use their, their national contributing forces uh, if the alliance isn't engaged for collective security in the region. Uh, and that was what was most recent memory at the time. Yeah, and, and, and as I recall, that was the first time that the European Union took on a major operation was kind of a battle handover from NATO-led mission in the Balkans to an EU-led mission using NATO assets and capability, which is the definition of the Berlin Plus arrangement. So yeah. it did facilitate the EU to pick up some burden sharing, to take some of the weight in the Baltics, but still under the framework of a, of a um, NATO uh, led or NATO, NATO supplied um, force structure. You know, DSECUR is designated the head of these Berlin Plus. Uh, well, that's an interesting point there. So the the deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe is always a European because the Supreme Allied Commander is always an American. And so these, <laughs> yeah, these Berlin Plus agreements allowed for or envisioned, hey, if it's one of these European problems with European contributions outside of NATO, then we would allow the European, who is the general or uh, the deputy Supreme Allied Commander, to command those things. Uh, so that was an allowance as well. Uh, and this essentially what grew out of St. Malo which was UK and France, grew to a no-kidding EU uh, um, uh, ability uh, to take on conflict prevention and crisis management in Europe. Uh, what's interesting is this would imply that NATO's role was more collective defense. So this is kind of uh, encroaching on market share, right? Yeah, yeah so the, under the European security defense policy, Basically, the EU took on what's known as the Petersburg task, kind of those tasks at the lower end of the spectrum, crisis management, cooperative security, where NATO declined to get involved, at least under Berlin Plus, mm -hmm. and, and, and a shift towards NATO being more focused on collective defense, even right. though at that time th there was really not that much of a need to deter Russia. Russia was a partner. Um, so it was an interesting time for— Right. And all of this is pre-9-11. Mm-hmm. And, uh, which is the next sort of strategic change uh, on the horizon, which changed things to NATO's uh, choice uh, to, uh, to do out-of-area operations, mm -hmm. far out-of-area right. in, the, in the Hindu Kush. So that's, that's the next sort of strategic uh, development on the horizon. Yeah, so I'd like to get just fast forward a little bit now and talk about recent uh, developments, I guess, in, in, with regards to European strategic autonomy and we all know Russia intervened in, in, in Ukraine in 2014. They seized Crimea. So this notion of partnership with Russia and a focus on crisis management, cooperative security, kind of seemed like we needed we adjusted too far. We needed to go back and focus on, at least within NATO, the, the core mission of collective defense. But it was also, I think, a change within the European Union about, you know, maybe we need to think about how we're doing business. And in, in, in 2016, 
uh, the EU published its new global strategy. And, and that's where I think the, the word uh, or, or the ambition for strategic autonomy was really clearly articulated. Can, can you talk a little bit about where we are today with European aspirations for strategic autonomy and U.S. perspectives about that? Yeah. So as you mentioned, uh, the recent or in 2016, you, the EU published a global strategy for foreign and security policy calling for closer cooperation in security defense uh, among member states. Uh, some interesting things that uh, on the bureaucratic side or the administrative side, uh, for those who have studied the U.S. acquisition system or our programming and our budgeting system, uh, it's uh, the European Union is uh, trying to uh, put together some things uh, that are kind of similar. If we, if, if we as European Union members can coordinate uh, our programming, our acquisition, our weapons development together, and even our uh, 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 in th- in such things as uh, a coordinated annual review of defense, a capability development plan, and a European defense fund, so a common uh, budget, it would be similar to our uh, U.S. Uh, defense programming and planning uh, system. And this also gets at some of the concerns that even Matter and Albright raised mm. about uh, duplication, right? If they right. could do some of these things. And maybe yeah. you can talk a little bit about some other efforts that the EU is taking to reduce duplication. Yeah, so one of the most uh, uh, prominent, th- you some folks may have heard of the acronym PESCO, so a permanent uh, structured cooperation. And essentially, this is the Europeans uh, within the EU trying to get together and develop their own defense industries uh, uh, they have an issue, which we, uh, as NATO members, United States, have always observed, which is interoperability, where you have many different fighting vehicles, many different tanks, many different platforms, all being made by the national militaries, uh, Italian or German or uh, French uh, uh, equipment. The Europeans are trying to say, hey, if we can get together and get two, three, four, maybe five countries together to program and develop a weapon system together, same artillery tube or uh, same type of helicopter, we can gain efficiencies and save money and get and, and do this uh, collectively. Now, PESCO allows for non-European third party to participate. So that's uh, essentially, it would be open to the Raytheons, the Boeing. Hypothetically. Hy- hypothetically. But that's where some of the tension is today. Uh, from the U.S. defense industry, which is, wait a minute, this seems like a challenge uh, to United States defense industry participation in right. European and, and that participation only as manufacturers and developers as opposed to consumers. Uh, right. So this is the uh, this would be the U.S. defense industry wanting to be able to be in providing, mm-hmm. uh, be in on the game on providing, uh, to be to compete in uh, the European defense industry. Right. And, and what's interesting about PESCO is this has some legally binding provisions in it. So when country, they don't have to be in it, but if they decide to go with a specific project under PESCO, they have some binding commitments under there. And it may or may not be open to third parties, whether it's Mm. countries like Turkey, which are in NATO, not in the EU, or the United States, which has a huge arms industry and would like to sell our fantastic material to our European allies. So that can be a bone of contention too. Is this going to... Mm -hmm block out the U.S. or compete with the U.S. And if you throw in Brexit, which is a wrench in a lot of plans, uh, PESCO is open to European Union members. Oh, and third party Mm -hmm. as well. But uh, in in answer to your question, Joel, about uh, what other types of uh, moves in uh, the realm of strategic autonomy are the Europeans making, uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, France's Emmanuel Macron, uh, proposed a European intervention initiative, which is essentially inviting. Now it's got uh, eight, I believe, nine countries signed up, including the UK, hmm. to essentially be able to rapidly react to crises and collective security uh, 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 events in the region. Right. Uh, one could see this as uh, France's attempt to. Uh, essentially bring the British significant military capability back into some sort of agreement with EU member states. And with only nine members, it would uh, imply that they would be able to make decisions and act quicker than uh, 
So, uh, so they have a couple of initiatives going yeah. on. They have this quest for strategic autonomy under the EU auspices with their global strategy. They have the PESCO, and then they have this EII, which you mentioned, which is outside of the EU, but allows former members or potential former members like the UK to participate. And quite frankly, it's easier to get nine nations to agree to something than it would be 28 under the EU or right. 29 under NATO. Right. So obviously, the U.S. Mm-hmm. has been pushing for greater burden sharing in NATO. The president said Europeans have to step up and do more. So we are 100 percent behind these efforts, right? <laughs> it's funny you should ask that because uh, essentially, again, we're, uh, the United States approach is, has been to press. It's, it's somewhat schizophrenic, and it has been all the time. You press the we press the Europeans to do more, but when they do more, is if it's outside of NATO, we get nervous and we and we begin to push back. So the United States has uh, 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 Kay Bailey Hutchison, and uh, who was the in February 2016 was the U.S. ambassador to NATO. She cautioned against any distractions that would uh, prevent European states from reaching NATO's two percent GDP uh, spending goal on defense, saying if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. So, uh, and of course, the United States defense industry has, of course, been suspicious of PESCO. Yeah, we see that offer for uh, uh, for third parties to participate in this. Uh, but we're is this is this a move by Airbus? Is this a move by uh, you know all uh, the European uh, or Finn Mechanica or Rheinmetall or others to essentially fence us out? Uh, so there's some concerns about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I think there's a, a recent example that shows again, the Europeans wanting other alternatives. And, and this is the recent example we talked about in the Persian Gulf, where the U.S. proposed this initiative to have nations help support uh, freedom of navigation in the Persian Gulf. The U.K. recently had a tanker that was seized by Iran. They didn't turn to the U.S. initiative, which was really part of the pressure campaign on Iran. Rather, they called for a European effort to, and I think it, look, it looks like it's getting some legs to cooperate and provide some maritime security and freedom of navigation. So, so I guess my, my final question to you is, what should the U.S. approach be? It, it seems like there's a potential for competition with NATO and U.S. interests by uh, European uh, efforts for a greater integration, whether they ever get to a European army or not. Should we support these things? Should we uh, work against them? What do you think? So I think that uh, what the United States should do is, in every case, analyze every situation in whether or not it aligns with U.S. interests or not. We should not have a blanket rejection of any European strategic autonomy, a knee-jerk reaction. We should, just like in the past, if strategic uh, environment changes, we should be pragmatic about accepting it. Uh, For instance, if the United States essentially should accept greater European defense autonomy so long as it aligns with our interests— Uh, of European security, global stability, and greater burden sharing. But at the same time, the U.S. should oppose those aspects which might diverge from our interests. Uh, If the the French are conducting counterterrorism in Africa and it aligns with U.S. interests, if it's not under NATO, perhaps we should be okay with that. If they, if the Europeans get together uh, in PESCO and want to create more efficiencies in their uh, in their industries to get more out of their marginal euro spent, I mean, if we're pressing them to spend more on defense and they can get more out of their marginal euro, that would be okay. If, however, this third party participation turns out to be not as advertised and U.S. firms can't compete on uh, equal footing inside of uh, PESCO uh, for contracts, then the United States should probably push back on that. And also, if there's, uh, if we find that uh, assets which could have been devoted to NATO missions are tied up in European Union missions, uh, I think we should express concern. There are some real things that the European Union can do and has better competencies, bottom line, is they can, uh, frankly, I think that the European Union is better suited with its border and customs and uh, uh, to, to handle or to work on migration from North Africa or in the Mediterranean. Uh, and to let NATO focus on collective defense, and the European Union has some competencies uh, to focus on security. And it reminds me of kind of the notion of comparative advantage, where, where it, it, the EU can do things perhaps, or Europeans can do things better in their region. It might mm-hmm. be in our interest to let them do it, but where we... And, and NATO provide a better vehicle and can do it maybe better and more closely aligned to our yeah. interests, then we should support it. I think that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, it is. It, the whole thing has been fascinating in terms of how we've progressed in our thoughts throughout time. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see where we've been and where it is we're possibly going in regards to this 
issue. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. All right. Well, thanks, Buck. Uh, thanks, thanks, Buck. Rob. I really appreciate the opportunity. Great to have both of you here. And uh, for the listener, we hope you come back and listen again. And that's us signing off from War Room. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.